says the, the transitional forms are extremely rare. That is, if evolution is true, you ought to be able to find fossils of uh, 90% reptile, 10% bird. 80% reptile, 20% bird. 70% reptile, 30% bird. 50% reptile, 50% bird, and so on. But he says this is extremely rare. In fact, the evolutionists can only point to a handful of very controversial fossils. So let's draw that diagram from Scientific American the way Stephen Gould says the evidence really is. You'll notice that I erased all the dotted blue lines. That's because Dr. Gould said we don't really have fossil evidence for those dotted blue lines. And then I did one other thing. I changed the bottom ends of those blue bars. I took away the little bend. Why? Because the blue bars don't exist in the fossil record. They only exist on this page of the magazine. It's the fossil creatures that are in the rock record. And as far as they go down, when they find a kangaroo, it looks like a kangaroo. It doesn't look like a part kangaroo. As far as they go down, they see a camel. It's a camel, not a part camel. Now, that to me does not look like the evolution tree of life. It looks a lot like the creation forest of life. And Gould goes on in the article that I quoted to say that the two characteristics of the fossil record are abrupt appearance and stasis. That is, that the first time we see a creature appearing in the lowest rock formation that we find it, it appears fully formed, fully functional, fully recognizable. It just abruptly appears. And then as we come up through the rock records, as long as we see that creature, it basically stays the same. Oh, a little bit of variety, but it's basically the same creature. There's lots of evidence of this. Uh, they're called living fossils. One example is the Wallamy pine. For many, many years, the evolutionists said that the Wallamy pine was a tree that went extinct 150 million years ago. Until in 1994, west of Sydney, Australia, they found the Wallamy pine growing. And when they compared the Wallamy pine uh, branches and leaves with the fossil, they were virtually identical. Hadn't changed in 150 million years of supposed evolution. The coelacanth was said by the evolutionists to be a fish that died out about 65 million years ago, along with the dinosaurs, because that was the highest level in the rock record that they found the coelacanth until 1938, when they found the coelacanth swimming off the coast of Madagascar in deep water. And they've since found it in fishing villages in Indonesia and Japan. And when they compare the living coelacanth with the fossil coelacanth, it's virtually identical. The creature hasn't changed in 65 million years of supposed evolution. There's lots more examples of that. There's what the living creature looks like. Uh, here's an article recently in 2003 about salamanders found fossilized in China. And they said th these salamanders have extraordinary morphological similarity to their living relatives. That's a very technical way of saying they look just like the salamanders living today. And uh, they say they've changed little over 160 million years. Army ants have been around 100 million years, the evolutionists say. But they haven't changed. They look just like the living ones. Plesiosaurs have changed little during their 135 million years of evolution. In the lowest rock record where we find a plesiosaur, they look essentially the same as the highest rock record where we find plesiosaurs. They found sea turtles fossilized in rock layers that they said were 100 million years old, but they said they're virtually unchanged compared to sea turtles today. And then here's a really big one. Blue-green algae the oldest living fossils dated in rock layers to be 3.5 billion years old and they are identical to blue-green algae living today. These critters haven't changed at all in 3.5 billion years. Now, I mentioned that the evolutionists do have some fossil evidence uh, that they put forth for evolution. It's rare, but uh, here's one of the evidences. Phil Gingrich writing in the Journal for Geological Education, a journal for science teachers. He had this picture of this creature that looked like a transitional form between a land animal and a whale. Uh, evolutionists believe that la whales evolved from land animals. And you can see that it is on its way to becoming a whale. Its rear end is definitely moving in that direction. It's already on a fish diet. The front legs are still land animal, though. What was the fossil evidence for Phil Gingrich? Uh, to have his artist draw this. Well, he tells us 
It was the head. No, it was not the head. It was just the stippled parts of the skull. He had no fossil evidence at this time below the neck. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it difficult to see how you can take that piece of bone and that piece of bone and then tell me what the front legs looked like and what the rear end looked like. But Phil Gingrich said about this creature, which he called Pachycetus, which means whale from Pakistan, which is where the fossil was found. In time and in its morphology, Pachycetus is perfectly intermediate, a missing link between earlier land mammals and later full-fledged whales. Well, now, that article was written in 1994, but they found some more fossils after 1994. And uh, in a technical article in the British journal Nature, which is the world's leading English language technical science journal, uh, there was an article in 2001 about Pachycetus and all the fossil evidence they had found since 1994. And uh, this was the evidence. Looks a lot like a whale to me, doesn't it? And... Uh, by our study of anatomy, the scientists can guess pretty well what this creature looked like when it was alive. And they said, these were terrestrial mammals, that is, land-based mammals, no more amphibious than a tapir, kind of like a pig. I don't know if you've been down to the ocean side recently, but uh, I haven't seen any pigs swimming in the ocean recently. So this is a case of misinterpreted fossil evidence. Jumping to conclusions on the basis of very skimpy evidence. And the evolutionists in the last hundred years have done this over and over again. But that's not the end of the story. A couple of months ago, I was uh, hunting around on the website and I went to the University of Berkeley, California website. They have a whole website devoted to evolution and all the evidence for evolution. And uh, they have evidence from living things and they have fossil evidence. And I clicked on the icon for fossil evidence and they had two pieces of evidence for horse evolution and whale evolution. And I was developing this talk at that time and I thought, well, this ought to be interesting. I think I'll see what they have to say about whale evolution. So I clicked on the icon and came to this page. And uh, it had a picture on the uh, left of this creature with its nostril near the tip of its nose, Pachycetus, dated 50 million years ago. And then this creature over here, beluga whale, with the nostrils up here at the top of the skull. Well, obviously, if that pachycetus evolved into a whale, then you've got to move that, that uh, hole for the nose. But listen, there's more to making a sea creature out of a land animal than just moving the hole. Uh, I'll give you a simple scientific experiment. You can go home tonight, put clay up your nostrils here, and then get your electric drill and put two holes up there. See if you breathe just as well. No, no, don't, don't do that. I don't want any lawsuits. So it's not just a matter of moving the holes. But then it says transitional form. So I clicked on that icon and up popped this picture. And lo and behold, the nostrils are in the middle of the skull and the skull is dated at 25 million years. I mean, that's perfect. That is a transitional form. You creationists, what more do you want? This is a proof of evolution. Well, I said, okay, I know what Pachycetus is, but uh, beluga whales, I'm not an expert on whales, so I had to go on the web and hunt around a little bit. Uh, that's what a beluga whale looks like. But now, I do see this. I wonder what that is. Uh, they didn't have any information right there at that place on the uh, Berkeley website, so I hunted around a little bit, found out that Ithiocetus was called somewhere else on the, web, on the Berkeley website and also on another website about whales, that it was the earliest baleen whale. Well, what's a baleen whale? Well, I got a picture of a baleen whale. Now, a baleen whale does not have teeth. They have baleen. It's a, a sieve system. They open their mouth, take in a big gulp of water and all kinds of uh, food, and then they let the water run out through the, the sieve and keep the food in their mouth. That's a completely different system from this Ithiocetus. But there's another thing about baleen whales. They are anywhere from 2 to 40 times bigger than a beluga whale. This is not a transitional form between that and that. <laughs> this is a 100% fully operational whale like that one is, and this is not suited for living in the water. Now, I can only come to one of two conclusions. Either the University of California Berkeley scientists 